the Catholic Church in Canada was not a monolith. I mean, uh, initially it was pr primarily French speaking and focused in uh, Quebec and then a few other of the uh, Atlantic provinces and eventually uh, uh, as a minority in, in what is now Ontario. Um, but within the church, um, there were many peoples. And by, by the mid to, to, to late 19th century, you have a church that's majority French speaking with a very sizable minority who are English speaking and there are Gaelic speakers and there are First Nations languages that are spoken because of the mission uh, that had been undertaken since the early 19th century. So for example, Ojibwe speaking Catholics, Métis in, in the West who would have also been nominally Catholic and, uh, and, and certainly spoke both French and English. So what happens in a church where you have this this increasing diversity of language and culture. And I haven't even mentioned German migration, which brings its distinctive flavor in places like uh, Western Ontario, Polish migration that brings its presence in the upper Ottawa Valley, Acadians uh, who are in uh, Atlantic Canada. So how, do, how does the church manage this balance, particularly as the great issues of the day? So, for example, the imperial issues come to the fore in the late 19th century. Who will own the West, for example? Will it be English or will it be French? I mean, how does the Catholic Church try to navigate itself through its own cultural politics? So, for example, in, in 1869-70, with the, the birth of Manitoba and uh, the insurrection at Red, Red River, or the, the resistance, so to speak, to the imposition of, uh, of Canada on, uh, on a, a population that is majoritarian, French-speaking and Roman Catholic, and Métis. Well, it's interesting because there, the bishops see this as a religious issue. They see this as a natural extension, as French Canada had hoped, of, of seeing uh, a little bit of itself implanted in the Canadian West, as opposed to the mass migration that was going to New England and to the mills of, of places like Rhode Island and Massachusetts. They were encouraging French Canadian mi migration and rather unsuccessfully to the West, but they still saw the West as one of those areas that would be essentially uh, uh, an area shared by both Catholics and Anglophone Protestants. And the English speaking bishops, who at this point were primarily Irish and some Canadian born, supported this religious agenda. Uh, in, in fact, they were supportive of the Quebec bishops speaking out uh, against uh, uh, any infringement on, on Catholic rights, particularly for education in Manitoba. When Riel uh, has the insurrection in the 1880s, ironically, it's an Irish Catholic lawyer who's part of his defense team, Charles Fitzpatrick, who will eventually go on to Laurier's cabinet and then become uh, Supreme Justice in, or the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court uh, of Canada. So, in a sense, there's a time when the cultural peace is kept by putting the religious issues to the fore within the church. Um, as the as anxiety grows among largely Irish Catholics and Scottish Catholics west of the Ottawa River about how far will Quebec essentially spread itself, there is a growing feeling among bishops that here is a case where we really should take uh, control of the church uh, in the West. And uh, this becomes complicated, of course, by new immigration by the turn of the 20th century. Where were the new Ukrainians and the new Poles and the Hungarians and the Germans? Where will they, uh, where will they side in this uneasy balance between French Canadian Catholic and English speaking Canadian Catholic, mostly Irish but some Scots? Where were the Italians who settle in Montreal and Toronto? Where will they sit uh, in this uneasy arrangement? Uh, and what happens is we see the formulation of two very different Catholic visions of Canada. The French-Canadian vision that sees Canada as uh, uh, essentially a country that includes a French Catholic presence in the West as well. And that's manifest in the Manitoba Act so that the schools are preserved there for Catholics and Francophones and in the Northwest Territories where uh, schools uh, are held uh, the same way. English-speaking Catholics find that over time they've had more in common with English-speaking Protestants than what they thought initially. 
Um, there's a strong imperial sentiment uh, among, among English-speaking Catholics, and there's a strong sense even in Rome that English may be the language of the future of the church. Why? Because here you are uh, in Canada, the confluence, so to speak, of British and American cultures. If evangelization is going to take place, in what language will it take place? And even the apostolic delegates, the nuncios that are sent to represent uh, the Vatican in Canada, are siding increasingly with this English vision of, of, of a Catholic Canada, but evangelized and institutionalized through the English language. And so even the missionary organizations, the home missions that are sponsored in Toronto and supported by the English-speaking Catholic bishops, have is this idea, we'll evangelize or, in a sense, we will bring the church and its in infrastructure to these new peoples, the, the Italians, the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Germans, and we'll do it in their own language if we can, but if we can't, then we'll use English because that will be the vehicle for their success. And so we begin to see the church uh, split quite seriously along linguistic lines. And when schools in Ontario become a question as to whether there be French language or English language, the same principles then apply. And so it's ironically the English-speaking Catholic bishops, Michael Francis Fallon in, in London, Fergus Patrick McAvey in Toronto, that really support the government's position of no French language education beyond the second grade. And so now we have uh, a cleavage that makes French Canadian Catholics look at what they call the Mozi Irlandais as really Orangemen in disguise. And we have quite an ironic twist then in Canadian history. And these ethnic tensions, French, English, do play themselves out in Atlantic Canada as well as the Acadian population and the Irish population struggle for control of the church in New Brunswick. Uh, we see it, of course, uh, in the West as with a huge immigrant population now squashed between these French interests out of St. Boniface and uh, the English interests that are, are being you know, increased because of the fact that Eastern Canadian priests are being appointed to the bishoprics of the West, Calgary, um, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Victoria, and they're not just Irish, they're Scots as well. And it almost appears as though the English are taking over by the time the First World War runs around.